Hey friends, welcome to Andy's Audio Crap, where we talk about audio gear and all of its glory. Today, we're actually going to talk about some modern equipment. Uh, IEMA here, op amp rolling, the history of op amp rolling is, why you might want to do it, what op amps are good, and the list goes on. Let's get into it. This video's sponsor is Andy's Audio Crap on eBay, where you'll find used parts, new old stock, kits, and occasionally gear. Thanks for your support. All right, I'm a little bit late to the game when it comes to op amp rolling. I actually purchased all of this about a year ago and gradually got to it over the next year. So let's talk a little bit about the history. Op amps originated back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, they were used in circuits, analog computers, for like mathematical operations and things like that. That's where the name comes from, op, is operation. During World War II, they were used in military applications. They really didn't get widespread adoption until about 1965 when they became widely available. And from there started a new trend. People started swapping tubes or valves, depending upon which side of the pond you're on. Nowadays, op amps are these little square thingamajiggers or thingamajiggers with legs, and they just look like bugs. And for uh, a long time, 80s, 90s, 2000s, these were soldered in place on the board, making them exceptionally difficult to swap out. Now, that's not so much the case. They're plug and play. Op amp rolling is very similar to tube rolling, which used to be something folks would do when you had a tube amplifier. You would pull a tube, put another one in, it would change the sound. Op amps do similar. So basically, they change the sound. But not only the sound, they change the quality, they change the dynamics, they change the performance. So you could have an op amp that's really rough around the edges, like it isn't as crisp. You can have a more mellow one. You can do this and you can do that. There are actually op amps out there that are designed to sound like 70s equipment. So some considerations that you'll want to take when you're looking at doing op amp is to make sure that the op amp matches the pin set and the specifications of your particular unit. The IEMA here is actually pretty flexible. Let's go through what came in the box and I'll show you what it looks like to actually do an op amp roll. First of all, you get the IEMA, which is a very small box and then you get the power and the power that comes with it is a mid-tier it can actually handle more which means it can push out more wattage the box itself is a presentable size it's small but when you put it together with the block you end up with well i hate these blocks i but i do like the small footprint of this Okay, putting an op amp into this thing is fairly easy. There's two screws in the front, there's two screws in the back, and the top pops right off. And if you look in here, you'll see there are little chips right here, and those are the op amps. They look like ants. So they sell special tweezers to remove op amps, and they just basically have a little bit of a curve at the end so you can get it in. You don't want to grab it from the sides. You want to grab it from the top and bottom. I really haven't had a problem with mine. The problem that I have had, though, is as I've been rotating op amps in and out of here, the ones that were delivered don't necessarily fit right in, and they require me to pinch them in just a bit so that they can fit into the guide. So how does it sound? Honest to God, there's a drastic difference between what came in this, which I think is a 5532, and all of the others that I bought. We're gonna go over how those all sounded here in just a second. First, I bought all my op amps on Mauser. Got my list of compatible op amps off of a blog. As good accidents can happen sometimes, I accidentally bought the same op amp that came in this, and thank goodness, because that'll be the first one we review. 
It sounded absolutely atrocious, awful, horrible. I did not like it at all. Honest to goodness, if you could not roll the op amps in this, I would have returned it. Second, it's the cheapest op amp that I bought. I think they came in at like 50 cents. The next cheapest was $7 each. We need to back up for just a second here before we go into the evaluation and explain why I have a Denon here. I needed a baseline. This Denon, you can pick one up for about 100 bucks out on eBay. It's a 985. These are very similarly priced. The first op amp we're going to review is the op amp that actually came in it. And again, I was so disappointed in the way it sounded out of the box. And, and honest to goodness, these are atrocious. Again, I mentioned I accidentally got a second set. I couldn't believe how poorly it sounds, so I put the second set in there. Guess what? Sounded just as bad. Looking at my handy sheet here, you'll see that I said the bad is anything in the mid-range, and most music has mid-range. <laughs> and it did sound pretty good on 90s music, which apparently has no mid-range. <laughs> Next on the list is this Muse, M-U-S-E. I'll flash the number on the screen here in just a bit. This one apparently isn't special enough to come with its own little box. It just came in this, this tube. I found that this one could be pretty blurry. When it was pushed to volume, especially high volume, it just started to sound distorted. And I think that might be because it has an overemphasis on the treble in the bass. Here's the LT1057, and it is not in here because it, I believe, is in here. Let me look. It is. My description of this one is basically, it sounds awful with rock, but it's pretty darn good with uh, country and rap, R&B, something with a lot of bass and needs some punch. Next up is this OP275. This dude is described as a dual butler. I don't know what that means, but again, it's not special enough to have its own like little box and special packaging. It's just lined up in here. This thing was actually awful at 70s music. It, it just was way too neutral. I'm not sure what it would apply to. Maybe classical music? Next on the list is the 985, which again, I'm going to stress, I really like this receiver. It sounds really good. And for the price point, wow, you just get one stellar receiver for the price. I got this one for free because it got damaged on the way in and they just refunded me my money and it was still operational. So I just took the dents out. I was going to put auto body filler in it and like do a fancy paint job with like flames and stuff, but I haven't got to it yet. The next one is the LM, let's see here, it's the LM4562 uh, Dual High Performance Hi-Fi. This dude actually, okay, so you know how if you have a pair of like um, L100s, L200s, and the harder you push them, the better they sound. So that's JBL speakers, by the way. Uh, this was the same story. This thing just kept getting better and better at high volume. It really didn't do anything bad. It scored really high. The next one is an OPA 2134. It's Sound Plus. It is, uh, again, in plastic. Just in a tube with tape on one end. I would describe this one as highly accurate, very little distortion, but there is something to be said about the missing fade in, fade out that you would normally hear, especially in 70s rock. For example, ACDC's Hell's Bells, the bell resonance wasn't as strong as I would like, but it did score pretty darn high. Last one is the AD712, which is apparently special enough to have its own little box, which they're not in there because between takes, I put it in, in here because I have everything out and this is the one I'm going to keep. This one is staying in because it is just, it's better than the Denon. It's not fatiguing at all, so the balance in the curve is just right, and the separation imaging is just really good. It's the most realistic sounding one, 
out of all of them that I tried. I'm going to put some, some, some closing thoughts out here. Not really sure I'm a fan of this. And, and the reason is that it's really a lot of trouble to find what sounds good. God knows what I'm going to do with all these op amps now. If I didn't buy all the op amps, I'd be going off of somebody else's advice. And I don't know how good their darn hearing is or their listening environment. I feel like when it comes to a particular sound, I tend to gravitate towards brands because of that brand sound. And basically what this is telling me is IEMA is not committed to a particular sound. And the design of this almost forces you to change the sound using an op amp. Yes, you could input through some other device, and then you could have this stack of devices with a stack of this crap, and you'd have to tether your phone in to change the dynamics on the other device, and all these other just crap. It's all like, in my opinion, it's kind of gimmicky. I do like it, though. I think it was fun. I really like the sound of the combination I found, but I also, I like this just fine too. And I put a lot of money into buying op amps that I'll never use. Okay, with that, I really appreciate you watching the entire episode. Thanks again. Like and subscribe. Have a great day.